Hello, everybody, and welcome to Office Hours, episode number 71. I'm Adam Coble, and if you did not know that by now... Well, hi. I guess welcome. Welcome to the episode. Uh, this is uh, this is office hours. What what is what is office hours? What's this? What's Adam doing? Well, mm, let me tell you. Uh, we've been doing this a while now, and here's how it works. You go to my website, which is www.adam-cobel.com. There's a link there that says office hours. You click on that, and then you can you fill out a uh, you fill out a form, and in that form. If you want to, you can ask me a question about game mastering, tabletop role-playing games. Sometimes people ask about game design or players or camera. Hi. Stop caring about my games. Care about me. I just want... Hi. Hello. We did it. Okay, there we go. Um, the reason that happens is the camera is center-focused. And for office hours, I sit off to one side. And so if I move too much, then the camera is like, Hey, look at all these cool games back here. If you ever want to know what's on my shelf... Now you know. You can just go back and pause. So anyway, go to the website, fill out the form. If you want to, you can record your voice. I would like it if you did. If you don't want to, that's okay. And then we'll answer your questions. I answer three of these every week that we do an episode. And uh, here we are, 71 uh, episodes in, plus a live episode. And uh, there's still so many good questions to answer. Today, uh, our first question is a question about getting started. It's a question about beginnings. Hey, Adam and Math Squad. I hope you're doing all right. So, in the near future, I'm looking to introduce a couple of streamers to tabletop role-playing and hosting games regularly for them. How do you usually go about trying to decide on a particular system for players who are new to role-playing, who might not even know what exactly they could enjoy about tabletop role-playing? And I guess specifically because you work with content creators, how did you go about finding a system that you host for creators who are new to role-playing games and where a stream or recording was taking place? Did you have like test sessions with them in advance? And I guess as a bonus question, what are your favorite systems to play with complete newcomers? And which systems do you think are best for viewers to follow on stream as the action happens? Thanks for taking the time. Really appreciate it. So there's there's actually Sir Flips a lot has has uh, obviously several nested several nested questions here, uh, which is cool because they're all kind of interrelated. The there's there's several several things going on here. So uh, how do we pick games to play with a group? That's that's one thing, right? Like how do we how do we just begin picking games? How do you know what game to play? So that's that's important, right? There's also um, how do you know what game to play when you're playing with people who have never played role playing games before, right? At all, people who've just never played an RPG. So that's a, a, a variation of that question. And then how do you pick role playing games? How do I pick role playing games specifically for uh, for shows, right? When I'm doing a role playing game show, how do I pick games? What is the process for that? And then supplementary questions, because Sir Flips a Lot has a pretty high impact on the action economy here. Supplementary questions as a bonus action. What are your famous systems, favorite systems to play with newcomers? And what are uh, good sh uh, show games? Because I think that there are. There are choices that you have to make around those things. So, okay, that's, this is a lot. This is a whole lot of stuff. So let's try, let's try starting at the bottom. And now we're here. Let's start at the bottom and, and we'll work our way up. So how how do you pick a game when you are playing with the group? How do you pick a game at all? How do you do that? So the, the question here becomes knowing your group and knowing yourself and knowing games. I think the first step in deciding on what deciding on what game you want to play is just knowing what games are out there. You know, like if you if you've only ever played Dungeons and Dragons, it's going to be really hard to, with any kind of confidence, recommend, suggest, play, GM, facilitate, whatever, anything else. Now, this isn't to say that you shouldn't 
play a game you've never played before with people who've never played it. Like you can all take that leap together. But I think that just being aware of as many games as possible, reading as many games as possible, watching actual plays, like just get your head into the space of tabletop RPGs so that you know what your options are. The broader your palette, the more beautiful the painting, right? Ultimately, when it comes down to it, you don't have to use all the colors, but having this metaphor is falling apart, I'm going to bail out. So the point here is, is the first thing you can do is acknowledge that there are a ton of different games out there and having a baseline understanding of what each game kind of does so that later when you need to make more specific choices, you can pair up your uh your games with the 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 people that you uh that you're playing with so like for example when going in to pick a, a game to play i will generally follow first of all what am i excited about right now like what what games do i as a player want to want to play right like what do i what do i want to to play right now what kinds of fiction am i interested in uh, what sort of, of role-playing games? Like, did something come out that I'm excited about? Have I gone uh, Have I gone back to an old favorite? And I'm, I'm thinking about that again. What do, I, what do I want to play most right now? And that's me. Like, me as a player. Uh, irrespective of, of what anybody else wants to play. Because if you are not feeling passionate as the game master about running the game, don't, don't play it. Right. Like don't if if somebody if you want to start a game, don't be like, uh, cool, I'm just going to pick this game that I don't want to play. Like, I'm not going to bring rifts to the table. So follow your passion. Think about the stuff you're interested in. Look at the games that you think you would have fun playing. And then look at the people you are playing with. Right. Expand out from there, because if you're the one responsible for choosing the game, start with what you want to play. And then look at who you're playing with, right? And and I don't mean just like take guesses. I mean like sit down with your players and be like, okay, so you've never played a role-playing game before. That's okay and cool. It's fine. It's good. It's cool not having played anything because now everything is going to be new and exciting to you. What kinds of other stuff do you like, right? What other What other things are you fans of, right? Do you like... Uh, Japanese mythology and giant swords? Are you are you an anime fan? Do you like uh, classical literature? Do you like uh, post-apocalypse? Like what, ask them what movies they like, what TV shows they like, what comics they like. Ask them about the things that they think are cool. And then if you have a good handle on role-playing games, you can generally pick out a game that will fit Right? Like, if you have a bunch of people who are comic book fans, who like superhero stuff, who like Marvel movies, it seems to me a superhero game might fit that, that group. Right? So, it doesn't matter if someone has never played a role-playing game before. You can still find out the things that they love generally, and you can apply that to uh, to choosing the right game. This is why, among other reasons, I'm so fervently opposed to the idea of people thinking that there's only one role-playing game out there, because then you're forcing people, like people might, you might sit down with people and they might say like, we love Marvel and we love DC and we love superheroes and we're all really excited to like put on our imaginary tights and fight some crime. And if you are the kind of person who only plays or only knows anything about Dungeons and Dragons, you're going to end up being like, well, I know that you love superheroes, but what about killing monsters and taking their money? Huh? What about that? Don't do that. Don't. So find, get, get your head around a library of games. Understand a bunch of different games and what they do well and what they don't do well. And that will help you to answer that question of what you should play with those people. Now, that's what I do, right? So like when I when I start uh when I start prepping for a show, when we start doing a roll 20 show or a role play show, roll roll 20 is a bit different and I'll I'll talk about that and we'll we'll start to talk about the idea of game as stream because I think that's the next bit. But when I when I tend to to start like planning for uh for a game, and I'll give you some examples from role play. What I will do is I will think of a game that I'm excited to run. Right. This is how uh, Roll Twenty Burning Wheel got started. This is how Swan Song and Far Verona uh, got started. Um, 
this is where we started with uh, with with mirror shades. All of these came from the game first, right? Where I was like, okay, JP, for example, I'm really excited about the opportunity to play a role playing game on stream. The game I'm really excited about right now, and the thing that I think I could make good, is a sci fi game called Stars Without Number. This is why I like it. This is where I think it would be cool. And JP said, okay, I'm going to get you a cast that will work well with that. Like people who are into sci-fi. And then I taught them the rules, right? So I followed, I followed what I was passionate about. I built a cast of people who were also passionate about not the game, but the material. And then I taught them the game. And I think more often than not, that's the process. I don't often pick the system first unless, unless either we're trying to sell a show for a specific reason, right? Unless we're like, we need to get D&D numbers, basically. Or this is a promotional stream, right? Like if a company were to come to me and say, hey, I will pay you to run my game I will pay you and your cast to run my game. Here is the game, and then I would have to find a cast that fits that game. But I would be I would be beholden to the to the game. Um, now the other time that this will flip around in order is if you have a familiar group, and you're you're not going to find this flips on your first game, but your second or third game, if you stick around with this crew, if it doesn't rotate like we do with Roll Twenty Presents with the the set crew, that's when I would flip that and say, okay, everybody. What do you want to play? What is something that we could make fun as a group? Now, you're not in that position, but you might come to that point. So I would say game first, interested group, right? Or what is the group interested in? Find a game, pair those up. So those are your those are kind of the two options that I would I would come at for that. Um, we never do test sessions ever. Like I, I have to I have to be uh, I have to be careful to pick a game that I think will work with the group and I have to pick a group that I think will learn the game because we don't have time to try out a bunch of stuff like it's a hassle enough and I'm going through this very deeply right now it's a hassle enough trying to get four people plus me to pick a game pick a time agree and play right on a regular schedule let alone get a bunch of people together and run several test sessions. It's, it's a nightmare. You can't, I just, maybe, maybe you were lucky enough. Maybe you were fortunate enough to have the time for that. But for me, mostly what I do is here's the system, find the people, teach those people that system. And I, I have success with that by picking systems that I think will fit with, with the players, right? Like obviously Nebula Jazz was built around the players and their sensitivity first, like what they're good at, what they're interested in, what would sing for them, and then how do I make that work with a game system that they will bother to learn? And I think it worked perfectly, right? It was a great fit for the total chaos versus something like Mirror Shades where we wanted to play a Shadowrun game, and I was like, okay, everybody, I guess I will learn Shadowrun, but you try to keep up, and learn as best you can. Like, what What was the episode of Mirror Shades? People who watched it will, will maybe remember. There was an episode of Mirror Shades where JP said, oh, wait a second. I know how combat works now. And then, like, two episodes later, we ended the show. So, you know, you, you, you have to do a lot of different heavy lifting as a person who is producing uh, a show and making choices around how much work you want to do, how much work they want to do. Etc. Right. Like there's there's a lot of there's a lot of questions that that come into play here around uh, your players and you. And this isn't even taking into account what makes a game good to watch and what makes a game good to uh, to to stream. Right. Like what's a profitable. So you essentially have two choices right now in in tabletop rpg streaming you have two choices so choice one is you play dungeons and dragons choice two is you play literally anything else those are your choices right and i i say this because dungeons and dragons means you're going to be a small fish 
in a big pond when you get started. You have a lot of differentiating yourself to do. You have a lot of like, how are we different or interesting that in ways that other uh, role-playing streams playing Dungeons & Dragons are not. You have a lot of competing to do. The market is saturated with content. However, your discoverability is quite a lot higher, right? And your retention will be higher. People will tune in, and if in the first few minutes of their visit, they can tell that you are playing a Forgotten Realms 5th edition campaign featuring a tiefling rogue, a human cleric, an elven wizard, and a, a dragonborn paladin, they're gonna be like, oh, I know all this shit. I have a baseline. I'm locked in. I'm ready. I will stick around because I'm not alienated. Now, if you play something else, literally any other game, people will tune in. They will say, what is this? Someone will say, this is the burning wheel. Someone might say, what the fuck is that? How does this work? And they may be interested. That might, that might turn into a conversion. That might be someone who's like, oh, interesting. A new session, a new game, a new thing I haven't heard of. This is neat. However, anecdotally, you're going to get a lot of people who bounce off of that, who are like, what is this? And you're like, it's a role-playing game. And they're like, oh, Dungeons and Dragons. And you're like, no, this is Mouse Guard. And they'll be like, bye, and disappear, right? It's, we don't, we don't really have the data. Like, I, I cannot compare. There's no controls, right? Like, what I would need to do to test this would be the exact same setting, the exact same time slot, the exact same cast, Torchbearer, Dungeons and Dragons, right? Those two things together. And then I could look. But honestly, like for me, I don't watch D D shows, right? Like I will I will I will turn in uh, I'll, I'll turn up to a show and I'll be like, oh all right, it's another five E D D game. Uh cool, cool, have fun. Bye. And then I'll leave. But if I tune in and I'm like, wait a second, what is this? They're not this isn't Dungeons and Dragons. What game are you playing? Have I heard of this game? Ooh, I've heard of this. I want to see what it looks like played. Like I'm I'm the kind of viewer who is really interested in new games, but because of the way the market currently sits, there are going to be people who are like, "Uh, eh, I am not interested in I don't I I can't I don't want to learn a new system. 5e is all I need in the whole wide world and that's it." So, you have to make that choice. And there's a reason you'll note, you'll note that for both of the properties for which I am paid to uh to GM we have one D&D show and one not D&D show right tomb burning wheel temporary RIP for burning wheel we have and we're not replacing burning wheel with like another D&D show so we have D&D &D and something else and then we have D&D &D. we got quarter swords we have stars without number right so the idea here is that if you can manage it i would say have your D&D show and get that audience and have a different show to get the other audience and then let them cross pollinate, right? Let them, let them move between the two because there are definitely people who tuned in to watch Court of Swords who are like, I love Dungeons and Dragons. There are people who saw us on the D&D channel who are like, Tomb is awesome. And then they came over to watch Burning Wheel, cross pollination, right? Um, so that's, that's a thing when you make that choice, you have to think about and something that I think will help as we move through the world of tabletop RPGs on stream, something will help us choose between D&D and not D&D, is there are companies, right? There are companies, Modifius, so good. Modifius is like, they're really learning, right? Whether, you, whether you're interested in their games particularly or not, Modifius is great. They are really good at engaging with content creators, like retweeting streams, uh, sending out free product, like they are great. They release a lot of fun, cool games, and they are, and they are, they are, uh, they're, they're learning, they're getting it, which is more than I can say for most of the other game companies I have interacted with on the internet, big or small. So, so you know, look at look at them. Go to their go to their their Twitter and and see like, do they talk about broadcasters? Do they have like people they're boosting? Would they be good to work with? Reach out to them, right? Go to their customer service page or, or tweet at them and be like, hey, I'm thinking about running a role-playing game. 
on my stream. What do you think? Right? So, so Modifius is just an example of a company that I've had some positive interactions with, and I know other people have, uh, have too. They've been really supportive of people playing Tales from the Loop or Star Trek. So look at that as, as a, as a choice, right? Again, like big fish for D and D or a big pond for D and D, but maybe big fish in a small pond. If you play something else and you, you can pick up, uh, people who are fans of that thing. Um, as far as your bonus actions go, uh, Sir Flips a lot. Uh, I I would say um, my favorite systems to play with newcomers really depends. Uh, I tend to uh, I tend to play uh, Dungeon World as as my go to because I can do it with my eyes closed in the dark with a bag over my head. Like it's I I could run that game in my sleep. Um, I think Fate Accelerated is. <sighs> Fate Accelerated is good if your players are aggressive narrators, if they really want to, like, co-GM. If you think that they will they will rise to the challenge of, uh, of Fate or Fate Accelerated, that would be my suggestion. Now, this is just for new players. If we're talking about games that are good to follow on stream, it depends on your setup. Because I think, like, I have a hard time watching Critical Role. Not because I, I don't think the cast is great, because they totally are. Not because I, I don't think that it's well produced, because it obviously is. But the problem that I have with, with Critical Role is that when they get to combat, because I'm so used to the, the massive depth of data that I get from watching or using Roll20, I'm like, okay, which miniature is who? How many hit points does this person have? Where are the monsters? I can't, and if I zone out for even like a minute, I'm like, I am lost. I don't know whose turn it is. I have no freaking clue what's going on. I'm going to just come back when the fight's over. That's the most complex part of a fifth edition game. So if, if you are running a game on Roll20 and you are showing that stream... I don't think, I think you've got lots and lots more fluidity, right? I think you can play much more complicated games. I don't think this is about, I don't think this is about uh, complexity of systems. I think Pathfinder would be an excellent thing to stream if everybody was good at it and you were showing the cat or showing the, the stream uh, to your viewers. If you're showing them the GM view or, or enough information, if you give people enough information, they will, they will eat that stuff up. People watch uh, the things that they are interested in. Uh, and so I think that you can absolutely do it. You could totally do it. You can do it well. And that is a kind of content. Now, I think the same goes for Burning Wheel. I think Burning Wheel is a very complicated game, but I make a point of showing everybody's character sheets as often as I can. We explain the mechanisms as we play. We show uh, all of the actions on the, on the screen. I think if you have the fiddly bits, you can make just about any game, no matter how complex it is, work for the audience that are interested in that. I do think that fiction first games with low mechanical impact will definitely draw people in more easily, right? Like you are going to have an, a lower barrier for entry for something like Tales from the Loop, Apocalypse World, something like that, because there are so few fiddly bits for people to get caught up on. They're just like, oh, here's the characters. Here's their base stats that I have on the screen. Done. I'm ready to go. There's only one mechanism in these games. You've got it squared away. So I think it's it's a question about the kind of, again, the kind of audience you want to get. If you're trying to draw in people who are fans of the system, then you want to focus on the system and give that information to your viewers. If you want people to tune in who are like, I don't really care what system this is. I'm looking for... Uh, the streamers, I'm looking for the story, I'm exclusively interested in the flavor, right? I just want the poetry layer. That's okay. You, you, you can apply, you can pick a game for that audience. I think to kind of conclude on Sir Flipsalot's suite of questions, what really matters is knowing your audience. What do you want to attract what kind of person is your ideal audience? Build your show for them. Pick your cast, pick your game, make your overlays, choose what you decide to display. Everything should serve that goal. 
What kind of person is the person that wants to watch this show? And then just like let let that let that percolate, let it happen, right? And then let yourself change, right? Or build another show. If you have a, a subsidiary of your audience who are like, all right, I love the D&D shit. I love the, the, the mechanisms. I love watching all this stuff. Yes, 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 yes. I am going to stay in. I'm going to watch all of this. This is it. Keep that audience. But if you have a subset of your audience who are like, you know, I'm not, I'm not digging the system. The story is great. Your production is fantastic. Think about doing a second show that's more narrative. Do, do a second show that's less like we're going to take an hour to do to do combat. I think that there's like this is true of, of broadcasting on Twitch across the board. There's lots of reasons why people watch something. Sometimes people watch for amusement. Sometimes people watch for uh, for uh, system mastery. Right. And I think you can get those things out of different games. People watch for different reasons. Build what you want people to uh, you want people to watch. Build the kind of show and have have a goal in mind. Because if you do that, then you know if you're succeeding or not. If you're just flailing around doing whatever seems fine, you're probably gonna have a harder time succeeding because you don't even know what your success qualities are. You can't earn experience if you don't know what you get XP for. Right? Right. Cool. All right, our second question is much more character focused. We're gonna we're gonna take a step from product production and, and creating a game to diving into some in character shit. And this is such a good question and phrased in such a cute way. I love this. Joey, Joey, thank you for this. I I, I was grinning the whole time I was listening to this the first time I heard it. Hi Adam. I'm playing in a D D group. In last session I sacrificed an enemy slash prisoner to my god by burning them alive. The intent was to intimidate them into giving us information. It failed, and I followed through on my threat. My GM says it's the worst thing anyone in a group of his has done in decades. But he liked the way I played the scene and the character. The other players were shocked, but seem okay. My issue is that I feel guilty that I insisted on going through with it rather than bluffing or just not doing it, as other players suggested. I can't help but wonder what other things I could have done to get the same results I'm looking for in my character and the story without doing things like burning people alive. My, I take full responsibility for my actions. In the moment, it was fun and intense. And I really don't want to play another vanilla good guy again right now. But I really don't want to be that guy who tortures and murders people thoughtlessly. Do you have any advice for players or GMs who are interested in exploring dark themes without being exploitive or careless about it? Do players have a moral imperative to be better than their enemies? So much love, and you are the best. So what I love about this question, what I love about this question is that Joey is just, they're so nice and bubbly and like, hi, so I burned a man alive and I'm feeling a little weird about it. What do you think? But so what's really, really good about Joey's question is that they they have um this is something that you don't often see right where they're like i'm playing a character who is terrible and everybody is more or less fine with it but like i personally feel guilty and i just want to like talk it out a little bit like how can i is it okay am i allowed to burn people alive is that all right and also can we talk about this dm for whom if you've played for decades and the worst thing a player character has done in any of your campaigns in multiple tens of years is burn a, an enemy alive? That's the worst thing they've done? What, what, what utopia do you live in? What beautiful fairy kingdom do you inhabit that that's the worst thing they've ever done? Seriously, are you kidding me? Do you play your game in a nunnery? Like, what? Do you play with infants? I, it's just, I don't, like, burning someone alive is pretty much on the low end of player committed murder hobo atrocities. Like, look, that happens every session that I play Dungeons and Dragons. Every goddamn session. It's called Fireball, kids. Right, this is exactly, this is a normal day for Dave's character. So, Here's the thing. Here's the thing. I got to I got to say, Joey, this is great. Like you are you're doing it. You know, you're doing it. And I'm going to give you permission to keep doing it. 
Now, my permission doesn't mean that your group is okay with it. It doesn't mean that like your uh, your GM is okay with it. It doesn't mean you have to be okay with it, but I would like to encourage you not to feel like so guilty. Like it's fine, it's okay to play a villain. I have done it once or 10 or 15 times. Some of my favorite characters are just like utter garbage, right? Such garbage. My favorite Dungeons and Dragons character, Dr. Grigori, garbage cannibal, right? He doesn't, he's not garbage that eats, he's, no, he's a bad person. Uh, uh, fucking Cantor Haig, Cantor Haig, the worst bully I could imagine. And then with guns, right? Like it's, it's not, you don't have to, you don't have to play nice characters. You don't have to play nice characters and that's okay. That is completely, totally okay. Um, I think I think the the thing here the real question is how do we play characters that are bad right not non-heroic right um that that are non-heroic characters uh without also being the asshole at the table right how do we avoid being assholes to our fellow players instead of being assholes to the characters in the game. And I think there's this magical word that will that will cover this whole situation, right? This magical word. And that magical word is consent. So the thing about consent, <laughs> consent is letting people know about the things that you want Asking them if they are cool with the things that you want being a part of the game. And when they say yes, fucking giving her. Go for it. Right? So, like, just what, what you just said to me. Like, I'm tired of being Sergeant Goodman of the, of the lawful brigade. I would like to play a character who burns her enemies alive. Because, my God, that's a good time sometimes. And if they're like, cool, that makes me nervous, but I'm excited to see you explore those themes. I think there's room for that kind of character in this game. What you have now is better than every every plus one sword in the world. Now you have consent, and that is a magical item indeed. So now that now that your players and your GM have said like, yeah, there's room for that in our game, you you can go for it. And then the thing about consent is... You check in, you continue to check in, right? You continue to say like, cool, all right, thank you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna play this character the way I'm playing them and something's gonna happen and maybe there's some like intense moments. Can we stop afterwards and let's take a break and like, hey, is this okay? Are we still all right with this? This is how I'm feeling. How are you feeling? Like just check in and if everybody is still good, then, then fucking rip it, keep going. Um, what I think, what I think is going on here, and I think this is so great, is that uh, Joey recognizes that their enjoyment and entertainment is not more relevant or important than the whole group's enjoyment and entertainment, and hopefully everyone in the group feels that way. They feel like the group's engagement in the game matters as much to everyone as their own. Like, if we're all out just to get ours, then no one will have any fun because we never ask permission to do weird shit. We never check in with people. We just kind of try to to get what we want and bail out. It's really not fun, and uh, it can create uncomfortable situations. The bad version of Joey, the, the actual in-real-life evil version of Joey, is the one that says, like, my group is a bunch of babies who cry every time that I do anything bad. And how do I make them shut up and give me what I want? And let me be the bad guy. I think it's like, it's, it's, don't fucking do that. Not to say you are Joey, but don't be that, right? Don't be mirror dimension evil Joey. Be this, this, this one here. Joey is doing great. So I think the way to not be that guy that tortures and murders people thoughtlessly is, is to talk to your group about it. Right. And if people have protests or people are uncomfortable, get to understand that and then and then back off. The other thing you can do if you don't want to do a bunch of pre-negotiation. Right. Because that's OK, too. Like you can you can sit down and you can say, OK, so my character is a cultist of the fire god and we believe in burning our enemies alive. And I'm going to wicker man some people and I'm going to I'm going to be a religious zealot. And this is something that I'm interested in. 
is that okay with everybody? And you gotta lay out what you hope to do. Now, you can do that, but sometimes you wanna, you're not sure. Sometimes you're not sure what you want to do. Sometimes you're like, I wanna play a character who is like a religious zealot, and I'm not sure how I wanna express that or what I wanna, like how I wanna get there. So let's decide on what tools we're gonna use in the game at the table to stop and start the action so that if I push someone's boundaries without realizing it or whatever, we have a pressure valve for that. So these are things like lines and veils, uh, the X card. These are tools that you can use at the table to allow for exploratory narrative. And then if you push too hard, someone can be like, dame, yo. Like, I can't stop. stop. We do this with the Roll20 group where we don't necessarily lay out at the beginning all of the deeper shit that we might go into. Like with the um, Burning Wheel, I was like, this is going to be a game set in this kind of like awful military uh, religious setting. And uh, there are there are marginalizations occurring in the setting because of these things. This is how power works. And is that okay with everybody thematically? And then with the details, we worked that out in the game. But if something comes up that somebody doesn't want to continue narrating, we all know that there are these tools that we can use. And we don't even formally use like the X card or anything anymore because we're all comfortable with each other as players. So if you're comfortable with your group, if you're familiar with them, you can just have them say like, can we stop and move on? So if you, know, if you just want to be like, I light the torch and I throw it in the fire and and the the GM is like, all right, the fire begins to burn and his his skin starts to crackle and he starts to scream and he's melt. And you're like, OK, OK, just hold fucking hold on. All I wanted to do was burn him alive. I don't need to hear about his toasted fingernails. OK, like just just cut. You can do that. And you're still allowed to be the murder torturer, right? The, you're, you're allowed to play your your evil super druid. But we don't have to suffer through the minutia of of your evil, right? We cut away. And you can do this for all kinds of content, not just like awful violence, right? This can be like sex content. This can be uh, this can be thematic stuff where you're like, we're all aware of what happened, but we've moved away, right? Let's we're 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 at something. We're at something else. Um. So like, yeah, there, there are, there are definitely tools you can use. The first tool of which is consent, the agreement of all involved that this character has a place, uh, in, in the, in the world. Um, and I think that's, I mean, you're, I, I have, I have a hard time believing. And, and the reason that I named this, that I named this segment, uh, if you have to ask, then you're not evil. I have nothing but faith in you, Joey, because this this thought that you have presented proves to me that I don't think that you could you could fuck this up if you tried. Like I think you care too much about being a good person to harm someone with bad play. As far as whether or not players or GMs have a moral imperative to be better than our enemies, no. Nobody has a moral imperative to do anything, especially not in a game like Dungeons and Dragons, which is about terrible, terrible fucking people. Terrible. Like just even lawful, <clears throat> even lawful good characters are just the worst, aren't they? They're the worst. We all know they're the worst. Hi, Adam. Long time listener. First time caller here. I wanted your advice on how to help a group of players I have who come from this sort of old school approach to role playing games, which I guess can be summed up in roll dice first and get with fiction never. Nothing wrong with that. I don't even want them to role play their characters if they're not comfortable with that. But they always choose to act coy and suspicious when I try to ask the motivation behind their character's actions or work with them when describing a scene or just co author in some way. And since I have to end up making my own answers, that tends to end with them either dissatisfied or uninterested. And the funniest thing is that when they realize I'm not there to try and gigax them whenever I get a chance, the relief that gives them is followed by the realization that they don't even know what to do with that freedom. I'm not going to lie, even the concept of fictional positioning makes them busy. Their creative tools need a lot of sharpening. So how do I help a group of players that don't know how to start developing their characters, adding to the scenes, co-authoring the setting? Thank you in advance, Adam. You're the best. 
So what George, fundamentally what George is asking here uh, is um, he has a, a, a group. He has a group of players who approach role-playing games as a problem-solving exercise. Um, and they... You know they they don't they don't necessarily role play their characters. They don't think about the motivation behind their characters' actions. They don't describe scenes or or take on co authorship. Um, and the GM George in this in this question uh, wants to encourage them to co author more, to think about the internal life of their characters, uh, to to uh, join in the narrative uh, in a larger sense. Uh, and, and encourage them to, uh, as uh, as George says, sharpen their creative tools. So, I don't think that you need to. I don't think that you need to. Um, we'll get to the fact that you and your group have different priorities, but I, I don't. I don't necessarily think so. The reason the reason I want to talk about this is, it seems like they want to play the problem solving dungeon game, and you want to play something different. I don't think that it's it's necessarily reasonable to demand that they tell you the motivations of their characters or co-author the scene or uh, help you build the setting because it doesn't sound like they want to. Um, I don't like, I, I am, I, I like, I like all sorts of role-playing games. Um, I like basic D and D, which is what these players want to play. That style of like, my character is Grog Thak, the fighter, but he has no personality. I don't give a fuck what he thinks or feels. That doesn't matter. I don't care about that. I just want to use him and his 18 strength to overcome the dungeon that the game master has put in front of us because that's how you win. You you beat the dungeon, you kill the monsters, or you avoid the monsters, you get the treasure and you're done. You win. That's that's the game. The game doesn't care about my feelings or what goblin culture is like. That's just not that game. I love games like that. Mold Day is one of my favorite D&Ds, right? I also really like the like deeper heavily in character player built worlds right like like you get out of burning wheel or like you get out of dungeon world or apocalypse world i love that narrative stuff i love being able to be like yeah but why are you doing this like i want to learn about your character but those are different games in Moldvay, in Basic d d in the whole of the OSR, for the most part, characterization on the player end is optional. Uh, they can, if they want to, come up with motivations and, and thoughts and beliefs and like intentions for their characters, but the game doesn't care why you're dungeon adventuring. The game doesn't care why you, you think or feel the way you think or feel. The game only wants to know whether you are able or unable to murder the enemies in front of you, avoid the traps and get the gold, right? So if you are playing a game like that, then, then your players are playing right and you can ask them, but if they say no or they're not interested, it's you, you kind of have to back off and fill that gap yourself it has to not be relevant to you to succeed as a, as a GM. Um, now, if you're playing a game that is more reliant on exploring the, the internal worlds of the characters, right? Like you could not play burning wheel with these characters because there's no game without that. Right? So I think this may be a mismatch of GM priority, uh, player priority and the game in question, but the problem becomes when we look at a game like Dungeons and Dragons and you can play it both ways, right? Then the game is no help. And then you have to have conversations like what style of D&D do we want to play? Do some of the players want to co-author? Do some not? Et cetera, et cetera. That's the, that's the trick, right? Like it's, it's not... It's not helping you because we've gotten into this place where there are a lot of role-playing games that just assume 
like I think George might be, they just assume that given encouragement, given encouragement and given the opportunity, players would, would love to jump forward and tell you all about the world. These, these players, it sounds like these players want you to uh, only ask them, what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? This is what's happening. What do you do? This is what you see. What do you do? And and that's okay. That is that is a layer of player interaction. I think I think the thing here is that we should not be trying to change what people want in a game. We can open the door, but we can't force them through it. I think also they're they're turning over that stuff to you. You can tell them everything about the world. And I get that it's like tiring. And this is why I think some GMs really like campaign settings. Because if you're the only one that has to make up every single goddamn thing in the universe, that can be tiring. So you can pay somebody $49.99 to get a hardcover book of, you know, how their universe works and all of the little details and bullshit that's there. It's, it's a case of player priority. Now, I think you're already kind of doing what you can do with this situation. You can say to your players, what is your character thinking right now? Or like, where did you get that sword? Or what color is your tabard? Okay, well, what, is that, what does that mean? Where did you get it from? But if they're like, I neither know nor care, don't, don't keep trying to, to push because it sounds to me like they don't, they don't, they don't want that. It sounds like they don't want this, this game. I think that there is no there's no ultimate way of playing role playing games. There's only ultimate alignment of player, game, and uh and and GM priorities. And it sounds to me like yours as a group are all squiggly. Now I do I do want to uh I do want to um I want to take issue with a, a single a single concept in this this question. So George says the concept of fictional positioning makes them dizzy. Fictional positioning is actually hugely important to OSR style play. So I know we've done like a full segment on fictional positioning, but that was, you know, 60 episodes ago. So fi what fictional positioning is, just to give you a framework for what I'm going to talk about, fictional positioning is um, uh, getting what you want by way of positioning your character fictionally, either by who your character is um, or by what they are or by the position you've put them in, right? So fictional positioning is... We go into a town populated by elves and the elf character gets to be friends and is treated better by the elves because the elves in this setting are xenophobic, right? That is a fictionally positioned advantage. So like um, in Dungeon World, when I ask a question about religion in the setting, I will often ask the cleric or the druid because they have the fictional positioning that would imply that their character would like know more about that. So I lean on that. Um, fictional positioning is just looking at, and it can be as simple as, um, I try to open the door. Oh, the door is stuck. Okay, well, the two of us together try to open the door. Okay, the door opens, right? Changing the fictional position of your character vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the obstacle in front of you. So why I think old school play relies so heavily on fictional positioning is because using Moldvay d d as my base model, Moldvay d d has a few specific rules, right? About resting, about time, about light, about exploring dungeons and fighting, uh, about treasure and monsters. But there's lots of stuff. There are lots and lots of stuff that it doesn't have rules for. And in that place, it says to the GM, it impels the GM, make a ruling. Pick a number based on the fictional position of all the pieces in play and let the players roll. So for example, if I have in the past established 
uh, that my character is, I don't know, say it was cursed with hydrophobia. And I have to walk across a balance beam over a lake. Everything else being equal, my fictional position is worse because of something that we've already established. The GM is going to give me a harder number to roll. That's fictional positioning. Fictional positioning is all over every role-playing game. You can see players, especially on streams, you can see players who are really good at this. Uh, for example, uh, Jeff, uh, uh, in control, uh, Jeff Robinson, Jeff is an awesome fictional positioner. Most people will look at him and say, oh, he's a rules lawyer, but that's not actually the case. Jeff doesn't often go to the rules in a role-playing game to get what he wants. He goes to the established fiction. You have to be very specific about what you say around Jeff because he will use it against you in a good way, right? He'll get what he wants by positioning his character to get it without having to engage the rules. And that's good play. That's absolutely good play because you're still playing by the rules. Like if there is a rule to roll, you do it. But if you can get away with it fictionally without having to risk the roll, that's even better. So fictional positioning isn't just about getting what you want necessarily. It's about understanding the fiction at play. Now, while your, your players, uh, George, while your players may not have a good uh, uh, creative engagement the way you see it, they are going to be deeply engaged in the fiction. I guarantee that their image in their head of that 20 by 20 room and where the fountain is and where the goblins are is very, very clear because they have to make fictionally informed tactical decisions about overcoming those goblins, right? I think that we can want more narrative input from our players. And I think that's good and well and fine. But I don't think that we can demand that players engage in a way that they're not comfortable with. I think it's okay to play old school style Dungeons and Dragons type RPGs with this group, George. But I think if you want to play Fiasco or something a little bit more uh, authoritatively spread out, you may need a different a different group. Now, this also might just be the game, right? A game can be a good hard reset. So what you can do, what you can do is take a break from the game that you're playing from the campaign and try something else just as a one shot, right? Try something really different. Be like, okay, for today, because you know uh, we got two players missing, so the three players that are still remaining, we're gonna play microscope today. And that's going to teach you really quickly whether they're interested in outputting that kind of creative that you want that'll be satisfying for you and the game is just getting in the way because sometimes playing a different game gives people a different context for play. Like I will play, I play D&D differently than I play Burning Wheel. I play D&D much less collaboratively. I'm like, no, I want to win. I want to get all the XP. I want to get the treasure. I want to do the thing. Um... So it's, you know, it's sometimes if you switch games, it can be really helpful. Um, so if you're not ready to give up on getting co-authorship from this group, try them with something else. Try them with Fiasco. Try them with uh, Microscope. Give them a low impact one shot where they might be allowed to do more and the game supports and encourages that mechanically. See if they like it. Then talk to them about shifting to a game that will better support that normally. But like, don't, Learn to enjoy this kind of play too. There's all kinds of different role-playing games out there and lots of different ways to play those games. And whatever you are doing at the table that is fun for everyone there, that is the right thing to be doing. So if you're not having fun, maybe play a different game, stop playing with these people, whatever, or find the fun in this old school style of play. God knows I love both and all, all the styles of play in between. Uh, and I think it's certainly, I think it's certainly possible. So I hope that, I hope that you can, I hope you can find that George on the rocks and thank you for your question. Thanks to uh, Joey and Sir Flips a lot as well for your questions today. And thank you everyone for watching today's episode of Office Hours. This is uh, Office Hours number 71. Uh, and we've, uh, we've answered some questions today. Now, if you have your own questions that you would like me to answer, uh, just go to wwwadam cobblecom slash office-hours. You just click the office hours link. Fill out the form. 
record your voice or don't, whatever, and uh, I will I will answer your questions uh, in time. We do this every other week. Uh, we intersperse it with uh, Hot for Teacher. If you don't know what that is, I'll see you next Tuesday. Um, come on back for, for more in the future. Uh, we will see you for more role-playing content. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, that's it for the episode. Goodbye.